Uh, good afternoon to all of you. I'm Lee Hamilton. I'm the president and director of the Woodrow Wilson International uh, Center for Scholars. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you to this director's forum with His Excellency Jalal Talabani, the president of Iraq. May I also say how very pleased we are to have uh, the First Lady of Iraq, her Excellency Hiro Ahmad is here. Uh, Kubad Talabani, the advisor to the President and his son, is here. Uh, his Excellency Samir Sumanade, the Ambassador of Iraq to the United States, is here. I think Barbara Franklin is here, the former Secretary of Commerce. Uh, Dr. Thomas Schelling is here, the 2005 Nobel Prize laureate. Uh, our chairman of our board of trustees at the Wilson Center, uh, Ambassador Joseph Gildenhorn, is here with Mrs. Gildenhorn. Our vice chairman of the board is here, David Metzner, and other members of the board and council, and we are delighted to have them all. Iraq is at a critical time. In the midst of uh, violence, the Iraqi government is trying to move forward on essential political issues that will help define the Iraqi state and help determine if Iraq can hold together amidst centrifugal forces. The coming months will require an extraordinary amount of political will and consensus building among Iraq's political leadership. To put it bluntly, Iraq needs highly skilled political leaders to step up. With us today, is one of the most able political leaders in Iraq, President Yilhal Talabani. President Talabani has had a long and illustrious career as a leader, advocating for Kurdish rights and Iraq freed from tyranny. At a young age, he emerged as a prominent member of the Kurdish Democratic Party, and through the 1950s and 1960s, he was an active participant in the struggle for the rights of Kurds in Iraq, including the 1974-1975 revolution against the Ba'ath Party rule. In 1975, he co-founded the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, or PUK, a political organization based in Iraqi Kurdistan that he has led for many years. The PUK struggled for Kurdish rights through the 1980s and rose up against Saddam Hussein following the Gulf War of 1991. President Talibani helped negotiate the ceasefire with Saddam Hussein's regime, which led to the establishment of a safe haven in northern Iraq in 1992 and democratic elections for a Kurdish parliament and regional government. The PUK later cooperated with coalition forces in overthrowing the Saddam Hussein regime in 2003. Since the fall of Saddam, President Talibani has been a key player in Iraq. He was a member of the Governing Council. He worked on behalf of a unified Kurdish position on key constitutional questions. In April 2005, the Parliamentary Assembly elected him president of Iraq. As president, he has worked on behalf of a unified, secular, and of course prosperous Iraq. On a personal note, I remember very well the many opportunities that I had to meet with President Talibani when I worked on the Hill. Starting more than two decades, decades ago, I was always happy to open my door to this amiable and very able man and I always benefited from his analysis of the situation in Iraq and the state of the Kurds. More recently, I was honored to pay a visit to the president in Baghdad during a trip of the Iraq study group. 
The dinner that President Talibani graciously hosted for us was considered by all of us a highlight of our trip. President Talibani, we welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson Center. We look forward to your remarks. After his remarks, he has very graciously consented to respond to questions. Mr. President. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and a pleasure to be here and to speak in the name of the new Iraq before such a distinguished center of learning and scholarship. I will give you an, up, an update on our democratic project and our difficult battle for an Iraq that is free and peace and at peace with itself and the world, a goal that we will never give up. It is our hope that Iraq will one day flourish in a manner similar to the United States and have great institutions of public services like the Woodrow Wilson Center. As a great man and a great president, Woodrow Wilson deserves to be remembered by the world. He was a man that advanced the cause of liberty for all nations. You have done a wonderful thing in giving him this memorial. In Iraq, we appreciate his words, especially when he said to Congress in 1917 that neutrality is no longer feasible for desirable where the peace of the world is involved and the freedom of its peoples. We value his declaration in the same speech that the world must be made safe for democracy. Wilson was the first president to give real attention to the Middle East. We in Iraq will, will not forget that he cited Kurdistan, Armenia, and Arabia as the three crucial concerns for all free nations of the world. Iraq contains grave consequences for two of these three bodies of people. Although his 14 points were only adopted in part by the United States, many people all over the world were inspired by this document and its legacy has only grown with time. The principles it de describes, especially in focusing on self-determination, are deeply rooted in our fight for representative nationhood nationhood. When the Iraqi state was created and the monarchy was insulted, a meeting of notables in Baghdad sent a message to President Wilson requesting his support for limiting the powers of the king by a constitution. Sheikh Mahmoud, the leader of the Kurds during British rule, said that he based his political activity on the 13 points. Shia's religious leaders in the South also demanded the implementation of those principles and appealed to the United States for help. I would like to thank Mr. Lee Hamilton, director of, this, of, of the Wilson Center, who has been a great friend to Iraqis for many years, even in the darkest days of oppression. We remember and are grateful for his support as U.S. congressman. The people of Iraq will always remember that the U.S. Congress passed the Iraqi Liberation Act in 1998. Also, I want to thank President Bill Clinton for signing the act into law, for declaring that freedom was attainable for Iraqis and also President George W. Bush for implementing it. Well, I convey to you the gratitude of all Iraqis. No expression of thanks could be enough for those who lost loved ones in Iraq. We feel your pain. We honor your sacrifice, and we will never forget you. Thanks to the United States, we are transforming Iraq into a country that is ruled by democracy and has the values of 
tolerance, human rights, and the rule of law at its heart. Every Iraqi who wants to live in dignity has benefited from liberation. Every Iraqi today feels that they have a stake in the new Iraq. Iraq is no longer the property of a gang that ruled by fear and repression. Under Saddam Hussein, the majority of the Sunni Arabs of Iraq were marginalized. Saddam Hussein and his gang were ruling in the name of this community. Today, they have 58 deputies in parliament, a vice president, a deputy prime minister, and a speaker of the parliament. All are elected by the people of Iraq. The Shias majority of Iraq was for decades oppressed. They didn't even have the right to practice their religious ceremonies. Now they are first class citizens and hold key posts in government and parliament through their democratically elected representatives. The Kurds were second-class citizens. They suffered from genocide and chemical bombardment. They are now equal members of the Iraqi society and are active participants in the rule running of their country, Iraq. The existence of Turkmen in Iraq was denied under Saddam Hussein's regime. Today, they have their own political parties and associations their own newspapers and radio stations. Turkoman is taught, Turkoman language is taught at their schools. The Koldo Ashirians are now recognized in the, constitution, in the constitution as an important element of Iraqi society and have all the religious and cultural freedoms that their fellow Iraqis have. Unlike the bloodthirsty authority of Tehran, Iraq today has an elected and representative government. With the regime of Saddam gone, the countries of the Middle East no longer worry about the threat of new adventures by Saddam and his army across Iraq's international borders. International terrorists have lost an important ally in the region who wouldn't hesitate to provide them with assistance shelter and praise and encourage acts of terror in the region. The benefits of Saddam's removal were not only political. The economy was liberated from the control of the state and we are now taking the first steps in creating a vibrant private sector. Our marketplaces are full of life despite the unsettled security situation. Our middle class is growing. A university professor today receives around $1,000 a month. Under Saddam, the same professor received 15 U.S. dollars. The development is mostly not in the safer parts of Iraq. Under Saddam, during the, during the 80s, Iraqi Kurdistan region had one university. Today, there are five universities. An American university in Sleiman is under, under construction. We are redefining the fundament, foundations that Iraq was built on and are building what the country's bloody past has destroyed. And we have no choice but to succeed. For the first time in Iraq's history, we ratified a constitution that enshrines many of the democratic values of human rights, equality, rule of law, and good government. A representative parliament and a national unity government are now in place after the historic election of the last December. In order to strengthen the foundations of the decision-making process, the political blocs which formed the government later agreed on the political program for the government and on forming the Political Council for National Security. Here, I would like to reaffirm that Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki was and still is the choice of the all main political blocs in Parliament. He is strong, and Iraqis he is strong, and Iraqis stand by him as the leader of a government of national salvation and national unity. 
His track record so far has been encouraging. Shortly after assuming his post, he traveled to Basra and managed the, to calm down the situation there. He ordered the army to prevent militia, to prevent militia activities as in the city of Diwania. Iraqis now, he conducted a member of successful visits to Iraqis know that he conducted a number of successful visits to neighboring countries in addition to London and Washington in a bid to strengthen Iraq's regional and international support. His National Reconciliation Initiative receives popular support from all segments of Iraqi society. I must note here that the people of Iraq have opted for national reconciliation as, they, as the way forward despite all Saddam's atrocities and all his attempts to turn the people of Iraq against each other. Taking part in the national elections and referendum on the Constitution were the first steps in our national reconciliation efforts. We choose ballots, not bullets, to resolve our differences. We consolidated this by plan of Prime Minister Maliki. The plan aims at bringing into the political process all elements of Iraqi political spectrum that condemn terror and violence. Our enemy, a, conting a contingent of international terrorists of Al-Qaeda and the supporters and beneficiaries for the old regime, attempts to turn Iraq against each other, att attempts to turn Iraqis against each other and take the country back to its brutal and bloody past. The calculated crime of Zarqawi and his henchmen in bombing the shrine of Samarra, one of Iraq's religious and cultural treasures, is a prime example for their agenda. They wanted to slide the country into civil war. The aftermath of the bombing was also a stark indication of Iraq's need for the presence of the multinational forces. Thanks to the presence of these forces and the wisdom of my colleagues in the leadership of Iraq, that plan was foiled and the short, the short spate of violence was contained. In order to rid Iraq of the constant threat of violence, we still need your help. Iraq is slowly gaining the ability to fight this war with its own soldiers, evidenced recently by the transfer of complete control of coalition forces to the Iraqi government. The coalition now has more soldiers from Iraq than any other nation. Slowly but surely, Iraq will be able to protect its own, own, uh, on its own. To, pr uh, to protect itself on its own. Meanwhile, our country should be a point of concern for every democratic country of the world. I can assure you that the immediate departure of coalition forces would only unleash the terrorists and bluster them. The prospect of safe Iraq and the Middle East would be completely lost. I cannot promise when or how the American presence will completely end in Iraq. But I can promise that American soldiers do not fight in vain. We in Iraq recognize that an incredible amount of American resources have been offered to us. I realize that many Americans were apprehensive about the decision to go to the war. But I ask that you put this behind, to, to put it, this behind you in favor of supporting a democratic and free Iraq and a future for Iraqis that excludes the threat of violence and extremism. I ask that you consider what the terms of failure in Iraq would look like and what they would mean for Iraq, the United States of America, and the international community. The interests of Iraq and the U.S. are one in this matter. 
I know that I will need much more time to talk about the situation in Iraq, but I will leave the points that I missed to the discussion and your questions. I will conclude by repeating what I told the people of America in my letter last week. The United States carries a heavy responsibility in helping us, complicated as, as the relationship may be. America and Iraq are now siblings in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, the President will entertain a few questions. We'll begin here in the middle. The microphone will be passed to those asking a question. Uh, Stu? Mr. President, you're a courageous man. What hope can you give us that there will not be a civil war? I understand the incidence of uh, Iraqis killing Iraqis has increased into the thousands over the last several months. I can say uh, and assure you that uh, there will be no civil war. It's true that we had uh, problems. We had some kind of uh, group extremist groups who were fighting against each other. But this was not, the, they were not representing the whole society. The main body of the Sunni society and Shiite society are linked with each other. They are for peace coexistence, they are against civil war, and they are linked to each other in a way that you cannot separate them. Many big tribes like Shammar, Jabur's are half Sunnis and half Shiites. Many families in Iraq the same. And traditionally, Iraqi people uh, were uh, in good relation. Only the dictatorship created this uh, kind of uh, conflict and differences among Iraqis. But I, can, I must be frank with you. There are in Iraq some uh, extremist groups from both sides. And there are people who are connected with Al-Qaeda, the remnant of Saddam Hussein, a big number of criminals who were released by Saddam Hussein before his collapse. They numbered 40,000. And now they are ready to be hired by anyone paying money to them to commit crimes instead of them. We will be careful to do our best to avoid all kind of... Uh, conflict and to solve problem. And I think that the National Reconciliation uh, Program, which is going well now, gradually but slowly, will be the main obstacle in the way of civil war. Question, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, uh, thank you for coming to address us. The reality is, <clears throat> as a courageous member of the Kurdish party, uh, you are clearly in a minority, and I wonder whether it's ever possible to really truly get a governing consensus, a coalition that really stands, that can create a democracy, a secular democracy in a theocratic area. Create democracy possible, and I think we created democracy. Now, if you look to uh, developments in Iraq, you will see that within one year, we had three elections. And each election, the number of those who participated were higher than uh, the procedures. We, as, as secular, I must be very, very frank with you, we discussed this uh, issue. We rejected to have an Islamic uh, regime for Iraq. But we had a kind of respect to Islam as the religious of, of the country, of the people of the country. And we have an article in constitutions saying that no law must be adopted if it is against Islam or against democratic principles. Uh, we cannot say openly that we are a secular uh, system, but in practice, I think our constitution is a, a similar uh, secular. It is more secular than be religious, although it has a lot of uh, respect to Islam and the values of Islam in constitution. 
Question uh, way in the back and then forward. Is it? Ian Tiley, Dow Jones. Uh, firstly, uh, how do you plan on getting investment uh, into the oil sector without a stable sense of security? And secondly, uh, the Kurdistan regional government has been um, uh, moving ahead with uh, developing new oil fields. I think in particular it signed a contract with the DNO, a Norwegian company. Uh, how does uh, uh, Baghdad has been very clear, the oil ministry, about uh, uh, there will be no contracts without the oil ministry's uh, approval. In the short term, how will that uh, disparity be uh, resolved and uh, what are the longer term implications if, if it's not? Well, uh, let me tell you that we are going to uh, discuss a uh, law for investment in Iraq as a whole and Iraqi Kurdistan in particular. Uh, according to the Constitution, uh, Article 111 and 112, the oil uh, and gas are national resources. The uh, value of oil must be in the hands of the central government, but it must be distributed according to the number of provinces and in a way that the needed area must be paid more. As to the contra uh, uh, contracts, regional government has the right to talk to the companies and to reach a kind of uh, understanding agreement and a kind of uh, contract, but the final, the final uh, adoption of this agreement must be decided by Baghdad because we said, we agreed all that the oil is a part of Iraqi national sovereignty and anything connected with national sovereignty is belonging to Baghdad, to the capital. There are got many hands up. We'll do the best we can. We have a question here. Uh, Mr. Yes. President, welcome to Washington, the uh, only city next to Baghdad that is uh, more politically divided. Um, you have always been a voice of reason, a voice that we could trust here in Washington. Many of us are very concerned about the possible aggression from the neighbors, uh, from Turkey in particular, from Iran secondarily, and I'd be interested in your comment. Well, I can tell you that we could uh, calm down our brothers in Turkey by helping them uh, in uh, the issue of PKK. We could convince PKK leadership to stop fighting against Turkey. And th this was the pretext of Turkish military forces to intervene in Iraqi internal affairs. Uh, we had good relations with the government, freely elected government of Mr. Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And uh, Iraq as a country, as neighbor to Turkey, is willing to have best kind of relation with Turkey, especially Turkey is a democratic country, the gate to Europe for us, and we have very good relation in trade and reconstruction in Iraqi Kurdistan. 130 Turkish com companies are now working in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, I don't think that there is any danger for invasion by uh, Turkey to Iraq Kurdistan, especially the American presence was always preventing any kind of foreign invasion to Iraq. And this is one of the main reasons why we think, we think that we are in need to American, even symbolic forces of American in the country to prevent our neighbors attacking us. Question here. microphone down, then we'll go back to the uh, woman uh, there. Mr. President, as you return to Iraq, what will you report to your colleagues and friends over there about the meetings that you've had here in the United States? What do you see as the tone, the political tone of America vis-a-vis -vis the situation in Iraq today? Well, I'll tell them the truth. I'll tell them that I received support and assurances from President of the United States 
that they will not live alone and at the same time I will then tell them that the public opinion of American people is worried about what's going on in Iraq. They are expecting more active uh, work from the government of Iraq to disarm the militia, to calm down the area, to secure Baghdad. And the American people cannot wait forever. Uh, Iraq be in trouble. And I will, I will tell them w what I have heard from uh, everyone uh, in reality without any change of what I have heard, both negative and uh, positive sides of why, what I have heard. I will tell my friends there. بيان سرداشي مع الحرة تلفزيون نتورك ما مجيان بخير بيكم شت دوام سيادة الرئيس دعوتك لبقاء قوات وقواعد أمريكية في العراق دعت لقيت معارضة من قبل كتل سياسية ومن ضمنها الكتلة الصدرية وكتلة الائتلاف وكتلة التوافق وهيئة علماء المسلمين ما مدى تجاوب البرلمان مع ما طرحته حول بقاء القوات الأمريكية والقواعد الأمريكية بالعراق بالعربي تريدين الجواب؟ الجواب هو كالآتي أنا لم أدعو إلى بقاء القوات الأمريكية في العراق أنا سئلت ما هو رأيك في بقاء قواعد في العراق أنا وافقت قلت نعم وجود قو... أنا ما زلت أعتقد أن وجود قواعد نسبية قليلة العدد ولكن كقواعد أمريكية ضرورية لبقاء القوات لبقاء العراق بعيدا عن التدخل الخارجي وأنا قلت ذلك بصفتي الشخصي الشخصية عندما سئلت ما هو رأيك بقاء قوات أمريكية ولكن أنا قلت أيضا أن القوات الأمريكية يجب أن تعود إلى البلاد إلا عدد قليل من القوات الأمريكية تبقى في ثلاثة قواعد في العراق وطبعا هذه آراء جديدة للعراق الكتلة البرلمانية لها حق أن تبدي رأيها وأن توافق أو تعارض هذه المسألة وهي مسألة قابلة للنقاش في العراق نحن الآن في العراق عندنا اختلافات في موضوع القوات التحالف الموجودة بعضهم يدعون إلى وضع جدول زمني للانسحاب نحن نرفض هذا الموضوع نحن لا نعتقد أن وضع جدول زمني الآن يفيد العراق أو يساعدنا بل نعتقد أن الموضوع يجب أن يركز على تهيئة القوات العراقية وتدريبها ووجود القواعد الأمريكية محددة في رأي لا يتناقض مع الاستقلال العراق ولا مع سيادته ولا مع مصالحه الوطنية الآن إذا نظرنا إلى العالم نرى قواعد أمريكية في بريطانيا في إيطاليا في فرنسا في ألمانيا في اليابان وهي لا تتناقض وجود هذه القواعد لا يتناقض مع السيادة لهذه الدول كما أن دول الخليج في بحرين في أكبر قاعدة أمريكية كان سابقا في السعودية قواعد أمريكية فالمسألة هنا ليس ليست بقاء القوات أنا طبعا أميل إلى أن تنسحب هذه القوات في يوم ما يوم يستطيع الجيش العراقي أن يستكمل تدريباته وأن يكون قادرا على الدفاع عن الوطن وقادرا على هزيمة الإرهاب أما وجود قواعد فهذا قناعتي أن هذه القواعد مفيدة وللآخرين أن يقولوا قناعتهم بأنها ليست مفيدة ونحن في بلد ديمقراطي نتناقش بحرية ونقول آراء مختلفة و نحترم آراء بعضنا البعض أنا أحترم الآراء التي تعارض وجود قواعد للقوات الأمريكية ولكنني أعتقد أن وجود القواعد الأمريكية هو في صالح العراق وفي صالح السلام والاستقرار في المنطقة Mr. President, I missed a word or two of that I, uh, Hala, would you go ahead please yeah. Mr. President, I would like to go back to the question that was asked by the lady in what? Um, you mentioned Turkey. You didn't answer about the meddling of Iran in Iraq. And I would like also to ask you that 
uh, you have been saying, not today, but yesterday, and we read in, your, uh, in the interview you gave to the Washington Post, that if the neighboring countries continue supporting the insurgencies in Iraq, you will uh, support, Iraq will support the opposition groups. Um, I was wondering whether you could elaborate on that, and does this mean that Iraq is going to support the Mujahideen who collaborated with Saddam Hussein and are based there? Are you going to support opposition to the Syrian government? Just if you could Well, I didn't say this. that Thank we are you. going to support, do so and that. I said we cannot tolerate more interference of our neighbors, and we have our cards to use against neighbors if they continue uh, interfering in our internal affairs. Uh, you can translate as you like, but as to the Mujahideen, Mujahideen was a group which cooperated with Saddam Hussein, and the Iraqi government decided to expel them out of the country because of their collaboration with Saddam Hussein's regime, and because they were fighting against Iraqi uh, opposition forces, including Kurdish forces Peter. in the area. Uh, but I, I don't think we will, we will be in need to Mujahideen. Uh, but we also, Iraq is not so weak that our neighbors can do everything and Iraq will remain silent. I think that our neighbors must understand that our uh, patience is limited. We cannot forever tolerate their interference in our internal affairs. And I hope this will uh, lead to uh, um, an immediate agreement between Iraq and our neighbors to stop interference uh, in our internal affairs, not to oblige us to use the same tactics they are using against us. Uh, yeah, Peter Bell. Uh, Mr. President, in the weekend news, there was reported as part of the political settlement with respect to the possibility of establishing a southern region that the committee envisioned by the Constitution for revision of the Constitution would in fact be assembled and begin its work. Could you comment on what you see as the prospects for that committee and what possible revisions might in fact be considered in the Constitution? Well, for, Parliament formed a committee to review some articles of Constitution and I think in this discussion about uh, amendment of uh, constitution will last one year. Within this year, there are possibility to reach agreement of some kind of compromises on some articles and uh, perhaps we cannot reach about all demands which are uh, pra raised by our Sunni Arab brothers. Question here, yes. Women, Iraqi women have been uh, some of the most successful advocates for consolidation of their rights using nonviolent means in Iraq throughout its transition. Uh, yet we see in light of decreasing security and, and regionalization in the country that women's rights are being undermined in certain, in certain segments of the country. I wonder if you could comment on Iraqi government efforts to uh, raise up and highlight the example of women's nonviolent uh, movement to consolidate their rights and discuss some um, the efforts of the government to make sure that those rights are not eroded throughout the country. In our constitution, the equality decided and uh, also decided that third of uh, members of parliament must be from, or 25 at least, uh, for, from the women. Uh, we have it in uh, our uh, regional government in Kurdistan and in central government parliament also. Uh, women are represented in government. We have ministers. Uh, from six ministers of Kurdish Kurdistan Alliance, two of them are ladies. And they, uh, there are two other uh, ladies from other uh, blocks in the cabinet. Uh, I think you are right that uh, Iraqi women were always and still active in defending their uh, rights. And all democratic forces, and uh, I myself, were supporting the women's struggle for their full 
equality with men in Iraq. Okay, a, quite a Scott in the middle here, and then uh, way in the corner, yeah. Mr. President, uh, could you give us your assessment of the trial of Saddam Hussein, the direction it's going, and the impact you think it may have once it eventually concludes? You know, Saddam Hussein uh, committed many, many crimes against Iraqi people, and we have uh, tons of documents uh, against him. But the uh, trial is open for everyone, and uh, we try to show that we are, as a democratic country, giving full right for uh, even Saddam Hussein to defend himself and uh, to say his word. Uh, the trial is going well, in my opinion, and this is a kind of new Iraq, which is showing this kind of uh, tolerance to listen to Saddam Hussein in the court. All right, sir, in the corner. Could you please uh, tell us which countries your neighbors you're cautioning not to meddle in Iraq? And uh, uh, you say your patience could wear thin. What would you do about it? We don't want to say the names of our neighbors. We you mean don't. all of them. <laughs> and you just have so many neighbors. No, we don't want and to. And you said things are fine with Turkey. We, we so do, I don't know who you're, you're. I don't know who you're challenging. We are uh, telling everyone, all neighbors. We are asking them not to interfere in our internal affairs. Okay. Uh, yes, Den Dennis Cook. Uh, Mr. President, I wonder if you'd give us your assessment of why the security situation in Iraq never seems to get better. Uh, let us first say that it's better. Uh, I can give you examples of that. Uh, last year, many towns were under the control of uh, terrorists. Mosul area, for example. Now, Mosul area is a very important part, part of Iraq with millions of inhabitants under the control of the government. The town and Tel uh, uh, Shargat and other uh, places. And East Mosul also is calm and quiet under the control of the government. In many places, Iraqi government could restore the authority and order in these places. If you look to Baghdad itself, last year we have daily between 10 to 14 uh, car bombs. Nowadays we have between uh, 1 to 4 car bombs one a day. Uh, and uh, uh, in the uh, look to other part of Iraq, we have now 12, 12 governorates skewed in the north and in the south. Uh, in Kurdistan, if you go to s s visit it, you will see full uh, skewed area, and uh, there is no need even for foreigners to have protector. In the south, we have many provinces also uh, liberated from terrorists and uh, skewed. Uh, the troubled area is Baghdad, and unfortunately, Baghdad, uh, the um, media, all of uh, them are in Baghdad, and they are reporting daily what's happening in Baghdad, and they are neglecting what is going on in other parts of Iraq. Even in Baghdad, we could uh, skew some areas like Azamiya, Kazamiya, Karada, Jadriya, Dora. And now we are gradually, according to the plan, uh, which uh, adopted by the government, uh, security plan of Baghdad, we are going to restore uh, peace and uh, order in many other places. But unfortunately, media is only focusing on negative sides and exaggerating it. Uh, Mr. President. Uh, okay, there, there are a lot of hands up. We'll try to take two, maybe three more questions. Mr. President, is that all right? Three more questions? Yeah. All right, uh, yours, Norma. Yours is an ancient civilization with a great patrimony, much of which is in the museums in your country. The American people who have been overseeing the security of, that muse of your museums have now left, and the appointed head of the museum is from a party of extremism. 
what are you doing to maintain this great history of your country? Unfortunately, we couldn't uh, protect our museums after the liberation. It was looted. And uh, now we are trying to get it back. But nowadays, we have uh, special forces for protecting our museums. And we will try, by all means, to prevent foreigners from coming to take or to buy uh, parts of it in different parts of Iraq. Okay, we'll have two more questions. One, Dan, in the back, and then one in the middle, in the back row. Dan, Dan. Mr. President, um, I understand that Parliament is currently considering um, the, the autonomous, uh, having the regions function autonomously in Iraq. And could you tell us what, in your um, a, uh, assessment, how would that affect if um, the security situation in Iraq if there was more autonomy uh, of the regions? The problem of uh, federation solved according to constitution because constitution uh, described Iraq as a federative, a democratic, united, independent uh, republic. Uh, but how to implement it in other parts of Iraq? As to Iraqi Kurdistan, everyone recognizing this right for uh, Kurdish people because they consider Kurdish people uh, as a nation, as a people, they have the right to rule their area. But up to the other parts of Iraq, there are differences about uh, among Arabs. Some of them are supporting Federation of the South, some of them are against. I don't think it will lead to any trouble, but it's up to the people to decide. If they want, according to their free will, well, we must respect it. If they didn't, okay. Uh, okay, the final question here. Uh, Mr. President, I know that you are uh, against the death sentence uh, in Iraq, or generally speaking and you have been a lifelong uh, fighter against serious violations of human rights uh, in the country. How do you react that the United Nations last week published a report stating that the situation of human rights in Iraq today is much worse than that of Saddam Hussein, and how can you remedy the situation if it's true? I think it is a big lie to say that it is worse than the time of Saddam Hussein, and the, you cannot compare the situation Go to see uh, grave, mass graves with 100,000 of Iraqis and compare it with what's happening in, now in Iraq. How you can say that it is worse at the time of Saddam Hussein? Uh, there are some kind of violation in one ministry, which is Minister of Interior, other way, where there is no any kind of violation for human rights. Human rights is a part of Iraqi constitution and it is very well respected uh, in all parts of Iraq. But there was some kind of violation for human rights in the Ministry of Interior, and Iraqi government took measures. 33 officers are now under arrest for violating these uh, human rights there. But compared with Saddam Hussein, it's something terrible. We'll ask here that you remain in your seats until the president and his delegation have departed the room. Uh, all of you who are invited guests uh, are welcome to come to the reception uh, immediately following this event. Mr. President, uh, we thank you. Let's express our appreciation to the president. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.